but they didn't do anything about it. And if they did, they thought the solution was to send black people to Africa, to the American Colonization Society. But Clay's attitude was set them free, and as, a, and as an abolitionist, uh, to incorporate them into American society. Few people could have survived in the South with this kind of an attitude, to have lived in a slave state and been an abolitionist, to be a plantation owner, and to believe in free labor. But Clay survived for a very good reason. If you can imagine Muhammad Ali in his prime, and then imagine Muhammad Ali as a white man with the same build, the same physical strength, you can picture what Cassius Marcellus Clay I looked like. He was six foot three, 215 pounds, and about as tough as they came. In fact, as one source described him, and a bit of exaggeration, Clay had a heavy stock of jet black hair. They retained its color way past middle age. The only time he ever lost a hair was in a fight, and even then, it grew back immediately. Clay's greatest pleasure in life was fighting, and in fact, he thrived on living in a tense and violent world in which everyone else around him opposed what he stood for. And not only did he love to fight, his favorite weapon was the Bowie knife. Clay quickly discovered that the easiest way to pick a fight with the Bowie knife was to walk into a pro-slavery rally alone with, of course, your Bowie knife. The Bowie knife was a frontiersman's tool, a knife uh, developed by Jim Bowie and his brother Resin Bowie, a knife designed originally for skinning animals. It has a, a blade 12 to 18 inches long. It comes up like this, and on the end has a little uh, cut out of it, and you can slice people on the upswing or slash them with the downswing. downswing a knife preferred by frontiersmen in the 19th century. Clay loved to fight with this weapon. And when he'd walk into a pro-slavery rally, he'd walk up to the speaker's podium, push the speaker out of the way, and then with an audience that was there to listen to a pro-slavery message, he would deliver the message for abolitionism. It always led to a fight. Always they would storm the podium, and always Clay would get the opportunity to call people up. He loved to fight when he had the physical disadvantage, because he loved to overwhelm and overcome superior odds. Clay was particularly fond of heckling his congressman from Kentucky, a man named Robert Wycliffe. Wycliffe was a supporter of slavery. And every time that Wycliffe came back to his home district and gave a speech and mentioned slavery, Clay was sitting there in the audience, always ready to stand up, always ready to heckle him. Uh, Wycliffe always knew that Clay would do this. He never knew exactly what he was going to say, but it was always designed to pick a fight. Clay once stood up in the middle of the audience and said, Mr. Wycliffe, I have no interest in interrupting you. Of course, that's what he just done. But I felt that justice demanded me to say that what you're saying is a damned lie. But since I have no interest in interrupting you, I'll take my seat and you can resume your lies. He did so, and of course, there was an immediate brawl. Wycliffe finally got tired of this behavior and he began to hire armed guards to protect his rallies. But Clay always defeated his guards. Finally, Robert Wycliffe hired a professional a killer from uh, Louisiana. And this is a description of what happened. This is from William Townsend's book, The Lion of Whitehall. For the first and only time, so far as I know, Kentuckians felt it necessary to import their gunmen and fighting men from outside the state. They sent to New Orleans, where there was a very large and a very reckless gentleman who went by the name of Samuel M. Brown, and who boasted that he was the proud hero of 40 fights and that he had never lost a battle. The week after that, they had a political rally out at Russell's Cave, some five or six miles from Lexington, Kentucky. Brown was there without Clay's knowledge. I don't think it would have made any difference, but anyhow, he was there without Clay's knowing it. And when Clay interrupted Robert Wycliffe, challenged some statement that he had made about slavery, Brown, standing immediately behind Clay, knocked Clay down with a walking cane. When Clay got up, drawing his bowie knife as he did, he found Brown with a pistol pointed at his breast and standing about 15 feet away. And as Clay advanced on Brown, Brown waited until Clay got within arm's length and fired the pistol. 
but in another instant, Clay was on Brown. Clay cut off one of Brown's ears, so the indictment for Mayhem says, and then for good measure, he gouged out one of Brown's eyes. And then for a still better measure, he split Brown's head to the bone, and then grabbing him by the neck and by the crotch, wrestler fashion, he threw Brown over a low wall. The proud hero of 40 fights rolled ignominiously down the bluff into the dark waters of Russell's cave. They took Clay into the house to examine him, thinking that he had been fatally shot. They found, though, that as Clay had drawn his bowie knife, his scabbard had been lifted, and the bullet had hit the metal point at the tip of the scabbard, leaving only a small red spot directly over Clay's heart. The bullet had gone around and come out the back of his uh, vest and had dropped out on the floor. Clay's the kind of guy that you want to go into the 7-Eleven and uh, find out what lottery number he picks. The story continues. This intensely pro-slavery community saw to it at once that Cash Clay was indicted for mayhem, and he was tried before a pro-slavery jury. But he was defended upon this occasion by his cousin, Senator Henry Clay, who really turned on for the jury. Near the close of his speech, Henry Clay said to the jury, quote, standing there without aiders or abettors, without popular sympathy, with the pistol of a hired murderer pointed at his heart, would you have had him meaningly and cowardly fly? Or would you have had him do just what he did do, there to stand or there to fall? Then he turned to Cassius Clay, who was sitting calmly at the trial table, and he pointed his long, bony finger at Cassius, and he said, if he had not stood his ground, he would have been unworthy of the great name that he bears. Well, this pro-slavery jury, for some reason or another, thought that Cousin Henry was right about that, and that perhaps Clay had behaved well. He was miraculously acquitted and immediately resumed his carving activities. Once, Clay walked into a pro-slavery rally. As usual, he was the only abolitionist in the house. He rushed up to the speaker's podium, pushed the speaker out of the way, seized the podium, stared at his audience, and then proceeded to deliver a speech against slavery. Five men jumped up in the front row and grabbed him. And while four of them held him down, one of them grabbed Clay's own bowie knife from his scabbard and stabbed Clay almost in the heart. That was his mistake, almost in the heart. Stabbed him right above the heart. By now, Clay was starting to have a good time. 